morning. So uh, in this talk, I will present some of the, my uh, present research activities. And in particular, I'm very happy that we were discussing yesterday about steel molecular dynamics, so I will just uh, focus on the application, right? So instead of spending a lot of time explaining methods, I just selected a few applications done with steel MD, and I will be able to directly jump so that you can uh, see also practical things done with the, some advanced version of the methods that you learned yesterday. Okay, so first of all, so this application are done on uh, RNA systems, and uh, I want to tell you why I decided when I started my research activity in CISA to study RNA. So uh, if I look at what uh, basically I know from the high school, which is uh, what was uh, uh, known basically by scientists, uh, let's say, in the, in the 60s, so RNA was considered just uh, as a mere scratch copy of genetic information. So you have like long-term storage, which is DNA. Then you have ribosomes where uh, uh, proteins are assembled, and they are the real motors in the cell. And then there is, this, there is this scratch copy of the genetic information, which goes from the from the chromosome to the ribosome. And uh, so this is a very marginal role. But then people discovered in the 80s that you can have enzymes made of, of RNA which makes it much more interesting, and that led to the hypothesis of, the, of uh, RNA as the mo uh, molecule at the origin of life, which is also very charming. But then the real revolution started in the 90s, when people discovered that RNA has a crucial role in, in the regulation of gene expression. And uh, uh, okay, this started with the discovery of RNA interference, but then also there is something more recent, which are ribose switches, which are uh, just pieces, let's say, of uh, messenger RNA which change their shape according to what they encounter in the cell and can switch on or off the gene on which they are staying. So there are a lot of very interesting problems in molecular biology related to these molecules. And I want to study these molecules using molecular dynamics. And uh, we already discussed that the typical time step in molecular dynamics is one time per second. But uh, interesting things for this kind of molecule happens on a much longer time scale, like microsecond, millisecond, second, minutes. Okay, so we have already seen this problem. We already know why we have this problem. And we already know that one possible solution, if, if we have, a, if we have a, some descriptor that allows you to distinguish between one state and the, and the other, is to just force the system to go from one side to the other. Okay? And then we know that we can, some way, post process the trajectory and learn something about the original properties of the system. Okay, and this thing can be done for any possible choice of the collective variable. Yesterday we were doing it for a distance, I don't know one distance, but I will show you also more advanced applications. Okay, so the two applications that I want to discuss. So one is a, a study of the mechanism of RNA unzipping. And the second one is a problem of RNA peptide binding. Okay, so this is the, the two quite independent parts in this talk. Okay, so when I started to study RNA so, and the assembly of RNA molecules, uh, I learned immediately that uh, okay, so it, uh, something very important in uh, uh, RNA metabolism is that uh, these molecules are like double helix. So this is a very schematic representation. It's like the double helix of DNA, so similar to that one. And uh, so they have to be assembled at some point, and also they have to be opened at some point in the cell. So for example, to read the information written there, messenger RNA should be open. And uh, so uh, this is a very elementary mechanism, that, that of opening and closing uh, a double helix. And so we started to check if there is like, a, a, if it's known the way this process uh, uh, works. So, I, I mean, you have two strands that you have to close. And uh, since the two strands are different one from each other, because you have two different termini, three prime and five prime, they're called typically, co conventionally. So since the, the molecule is asymmetric, then you could have that one of them is closing before the other, right? And so we, we try to investigate this uh, and to check also if there is some uh, dependence on the sequence of nucleotides. So if, uh, for example, you have uh, one in or cytosine, what happens uh, what, if only the first pair count or also the second pair and so on, okay? The nice thing of simulation is that you can do studies which are very detailed with respect to experiment. Okay, so this is the model system that we use. It, it's a very small RNA duplex uh, in water, so explicit water, explicit counter ions. This is also important for nucleic acids. And so because of, of the way we designed this sequence, we can just open it from one side and to the other looking at different sequences. And uh, uh, what we do is uh, 
We want to open, so this is like a molecular representation of this. We want to open this double helix from this side or from this side, right? And check the difference. And to open it, the simplest thing that you can do is to pull on this distance. Okay, what we want to do is you want to break this second interaction. So the simplest thing that you can do is you pull away these two parts one from the other. Okay? Okay, so these are steered molecular dynamics. And with this idea, so we just use as a collective variable the distance between the center of mass of these atoms and the center of mass of these other atoms. We use the time-dependent potential, which is represented here. It's just a moving restraint. It's the same that we were doing yesterday. Again, it's a distance. It's not between two atoms, but it's very similar. Uh, here we have all the parameters. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, like 1 nanosecond, 1.5 nanosecond each simulation, and we do it many times. And every time you do it, we have a slightly different trajectory. And uh, uh, every time you do it, you can compute how difficult it was to, to do it. So how difficult it was to displace out this, this uh, uh, base, so to break this second interaction. And uh, here you have the work as a function of time. And you see that every time you do it, you, you, you find a different path. Okay? And this is because the, the process is partly stochastic. And we know that the average work is larger than the free energy needed to break this, but you also, we also know how to recover the correct free energy. In principle, we have seen the Jarvinsky equality. And so this is done with, uh, these are like many trajectories, like 250 trajectories. And this is the average of the, is the free energy profile computed as an uh, average of the exponential. It's the same thing that we were doing yesterday, exactly. Okay? But then now uh, we see we saw immediately that there was a problem. So we have something like this, and then we, what we do is we change, we, we break on one side of the molecule and on the other side, and we want to compare. Or we change slightly the sequence. We put uh, one, we, we swap one in acetosin, and so on. So we have like uh, something like 16 cases to compare. And with a plot like this, it's very difficult to say where is the final point. You don't have like two clear minima. Okay, so it's very difficult to compare in an unbiased manner. 16 different cases. So you need something automatic that tells you which is the stability, which is the difference of free energy between the, the stacked state and the unstacked state. So the problem here is not in computing the free energy, but is in defining the two states, you see? So we are able to break this interaction, but we, we have no clear definition of when is the state is stacked or when it's unstacked. And indeed, we realize that if you want to look at stacking, interaction, there is a, a variable which is much more informative with respect to this distance, and which is the solvation of the base that you are unstacking. Solvation, with solvation I mean we count how many water molecules are around this base. Okay? So we are displacing one base. Once it's here, it will be surrounded by water molecules. You just count them, and you see that uh, So this is just a superimposition of many simulations. So that, that's why you see a cloud. And you see that uh, here you have a stacked structure where there are few water molecules around the base. And when, when you remove it, then it becomes solvated and you have many more water molecules around. Okay? See this number of fluctuating. But at least you can see a clear difference. So now the point is, uh, this, uh, we already have done many simulations pulling on this variable, but we realize that it's much better to interpret the result using another variable. And this is uh, something somewhat related to one of the questions that we had yesterday, so can you do steering on one variable and analyze another variable? But here we are just plotting it, but what we would like to have is the free energy profile with respect to this other variable. So we want to pull on one variable and compute the free energy profile with respect to this variable here. And it turns out that, uh, turns out that th there was no standard way to do it, so we have to play a bit with the equations to find, to, to combine existing uh, ideas to have something working for that. And so we have discussed yesterday a bit the Crookes theorem. So uh, we have bias simulation. We have uh, more than one bias in our simulation. One of the bias is the fact that we are moving our restraints. So it's a non-equilibrium simulation, whereas we would like to have equilibrium results. Okay? So to remove this uh, artificial effect, we have to discount it in, in some way which the, where we take into account the, the dissipated work. So trajectory where the dissipated work is more are weighting less, basically. Okay, so we do like a change of weight, 
And then we have uh, still we have to analyze our trajectory and pros process them properly because we have like a simulation. At the beginning of the simulation, the restraint is, is here, and of course the system is going to fluctuate here. At the end is here, the system is going to fluctuate here. And how can we combine these results? It's like uh, combining different results with different positions of the restraint. Okay, and what you can use is something that uh, also Max was uh, mentioning yesterday: weighted histogram analysis. Okay, I, I won't discuss the details of the equations. Don't worry about that. I just want to give you the feeling. Then we use weighted histogram analysis to combine the different snapshots of the simulation. And then we recast our scheme in such a way that it's just simpler to use, so that uh, we take all the, our trajectories, we compute the weight for each frame. Just a single number for each snapshot of the system that we have. And from this ensemble of state weighted, we can compute any uh, 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 ensemble average that we want a posteriori. So we can choose a collective variable a posteriori and just compute its free energy using these weights. OK, this is very, uh, was a very short uh, uh, methodological uh, uh, thing. And we go back to the result. So what we wanted to have is uh, free energy as a function of uh, number of uh, coordinated water molecules, okay? And you see that you have a, a, a profile which is something like this. This is clearly a two-state system, okay? And indeed, you can fit these two states with two parabola, and you can do it for this case where you are breaking the three prime terminus, or for this case where you're breaking the five prime terminus, for example, and compare the results, okay? So basically, this difference in energy here tells you how difficult it was to break this stacking interaction, and, and this is the same for the for the other stacking interaction, the other side of this of the double strand. Okay, then we do it for uh, many cases, many combinations, and and what, what in in the end I, I just go to the to the final result is uh, okay. In, in the bottom line is that uh, stacking on the three prime terminus, it's just one of, one of those. Uh, uh, is strong, uh, stronger than stacking on the other terminus, okay? And also, we, we realize that the stacking of uh, guanine is larger than stacking of cytosine. This is pretty reasonable because guanine is larger, okay? So it has more stacking interaction with the un underlying base. But okay, and then we try to, to see if there is any consequence coming from this. So the, 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 the main consequence of this is that uh, so if you imagine to which should be the, the, the process to assemble this double helix, so since the stacking interaction on the three prime strand are stronger, you expect that the three prime strand is uh, stacked first, and then you have stacking on the other side. Okay? So you expect that when a double helix grows, you first stack the three prime, uh, the base at the three prime terminus, and then the other one, and then three prime, five prime, three prime, five prime. Okay? And in the opposite way around, when you, if you try to break it, the best way to break it is to first remove the five prime and then three prime. Five prime, three prime. Okay? So there is an asymmetry between the two termini. So this observation is in agreement with the experiment where we're they trying to characterize the same thing in uh, in indirect manner. So one is like uh, analyze static X-ray structure and see which are the let's say the residual, the, the, the remaining information about this intermediate state, but it's very difficult to extract it from X-ray, which is static. Or there are ultrafast spectroscopy experiments which are very similar to what we are doing conceptually, but they have just um, a couple of cases. Or you can also uh, like validate against thermodynamic data. Then, but then we, we, if we just take, we, we forget the numbers, we don't want to look at the real numbers, we just take this information. So. That, fold, that unfolding is expected to be easier if you first break the five prime strand and then the three prime strand. And can we see if this very uh, uh, microscopic detail have some, can have some impact on biology? And then we have a look at how uh, an eddy case, which is a, so eddy cases are uh, enzymes which are designed to break double helix of uh, nucleic acids. And uh, so uh, NS3 eddy case from uh, hepatitis C virus is one of the uh, most studied helicases, viral helicases, it was a very primitive one. So if, if, it, if an enzyme is very primitive, you can assume that the, the, the features for which it was optimized by evolution are very few. Okay? So we can imagine that the, the, the way these helicases work is the simplest way. And if you look at how it works, uh, at least uh, uh, according to uh, current models that they have done, like with the uh, so, uh, current structures that they have done with uh, crystallizing these helicases in combination with the uh, 
uh, double strand nucleic acid. The way it works is basically it works on one of the two strands and displays the other one. The, the very nice thing is that it, it works in one specific direction. And indeed, what it does, it displays the five prime strand, okay, which is in agreement with the fact that that's the easiest one to displace. Okay, so th this means that this asymmetry in the edX could be the one possible explanation why this edX is working on that specific direction and not in the opposite. Okay, so let me just summarize this part and then we we'll go to the other part. And uh, so uh, the idea of this work is uh, was to try to characterize the asymmetry in the RNA double helix and to try to distinguish between the two termini. And we, we realize that uh, folding should proceed from the three prime terminus and unfolding from the five prime terminus. And, uh, and this could uh, have an impact on, on the biology uh, of uh, RNA helicases. And uh, so uh, if you want to test if you really understood this part of the talk, we have prepared the uh, JAX image challenge so you can go to this website and play with it and see if you give the correct answer. Okay. Okay, so, yeah. How long will the simulation take thousand years? Uh, the infinite time, because the, the, okay, the infinite is like uh, probably, so the, the, the typical time for these uh, modes is uh, on the order of several microseconds. For, for terminal basis. It's even more for internal basis, but for terminal basis, I think around that. So you cannot do these kind of things without uh, uh, accelerated sampling. You can do it with other accelerated sampling methods. This was just one simple choice. So why this? <coughs> Sorry? Why this choice? Just because it's simple. It's very important not to waste too much time in trying, this is at least my idea, not to waste time in trying uh, too many different methods. Okay, if you want to, find, to to compare them, of course you have to do it. But then when you face an application, I think it's very good to choose a simple method and try to get the most out of it and then spend more time, for example, in comparing your results with experimental results and try to give a meaning to what you found. But this is my... Yeah? Would the, would the presence of the enzyme shorten the simulation somewhat? Yeah, of, of, we, this, in our simulation, we don't have the enzyme. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, I understand. Yeah. 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 But are, are, you work, are, you, is, are people working towards working? Yeah, we are trying to do that exactly now. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this was like a preliminary work for that. Can you use the water Yeah, so the reason why we didn't do it, because since the beginning, we had the impression that that could have been a reasonable choice. But the reason why we didn't do it basically is, is that it's very inefficient, at least uh, with current implementation, because uh, you have to count many water molecules, it's, it's not trivial. So, but it could be done. I mean, if one is interested in the method, a good thing to do now is to redo the same thing using a uh, different corrective variables. We prefer to go to the, like, the system that we like more, which is the, the big protein and so on. Yeah? Um, how do you know that the end state, the open one, is related to the structure in the farm? But I mean, you are just comparing any energy between two states. Yeah. So, and that's okay, you can do it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, which state you will compare? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, if you, otherwise, if you are comparing between states that maybe are not relevant, then where is the problem? Yeah, so in this case, we decided two states, which, which not, by, not randomly, but because we knew that they were relevant for one specific process, which is uh, uh, unzipping of RNA, which is done in the cell. And it's very uh, important because, for example, when uh, messenger RNAs arrive at the ribosome, it should be opened so as to read the information there. And so there is a domain in the ribosome which is, is not working like this any case, but it's a sort of. That's actually validated. Open state that you are targeting is actually this is a structure relation. So the, the open state is not really structured. The only information about that is that uh, stacking and base pairing is broken. It's not a well defined structure. So there is no way to really validate it. 
And I'm just sort of a lot uh, There's a, there's a, who's fake, a white uh, remain? No. The, no. There is one phosphate less. Okay, here maybe you can't see it. Yes, you should see here, okay, it's moving, but there is one phosphate missing. This is 5 prime and this is 3 prime, yeah. I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, somehow the first thing may be constraining this difference between uh, the open relationship of fibromyalgia and, you know, different errors. Yes, of course. Some versions of breaking of those things. Yeah. That you have one of space in the fiber and the yeah. present is a different error. So maybe this is... Yes, of course. Error. Of course, indeed. I, I, at this point, our result will be completely correct. The reason why we, we, we trust in them is that uh, we have checked the experiments, which are not as detailed as this calculation, of course, but uh, they are in agreement with the result. And that's why we extrapolate. Of course, otherwise it could be just an artifact of the force. Who knows? OK. 10 minutes. OK, maybe I, I, I don't know what to do. If I, to answer more questions or to go on. What should I do, Jim? How many people would ask more questions if we just stated this part? Three? Oh, really great yeah. Maybe we just talk for a while. I don't know. It's up to you. I just wonder, how did you decide what's enough simulations? What's enough simulations? What you do typically is you do so, uh, a longer simulation, or in this case, you do twice the number of simulations, and you compare yeah, the and first half. Yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe I, I will go ahead quickly through the second part because maybe it would, would also raise other questions. It's, it's similar, so it's, uh, I mean, I, and I will not discuss everything for that. I would just want to give you the idea that you can uh, do also something more advanced with state and B, okay? We can go a little long. Okay. okay, so the second problem that we wanted to study, okay, I skipped the motivation. It's a problem of binding of uh, a piece of RNA which is called TAR. It's a, it's a viral RNA, it's part of HIV RNA. And uh, uh, small peptides which were designed in an experimental lab to mimic the big protein, the, the big viral protein which is natively bound to this structure here. So the idea is to design something which is competitive with the the real protein, so that it, it goes there, hinders the binding site, and so the real protein cannot go there, and HIV doesn't work anymore. So this is like two lines about the, the motivation. So, but, but then the, the practical process that we wanted to study is the binding of uh, these small oligopeptides uh, with the, these uh, larger RNA molecules. There are different possibilities, and we wanted to try to do something predictive. So to the calculation where we don't know which is the binding site, and we try to predict it. So it, also in this case, you could imagine to use pooling, but then the, only, the, the intuitive thing is you pull on the distance. You try to force them to become closer and closer, and you hope that the ligand will go to the correct site. But this is too much optimistic and doesn't work in this case. And then there is a, a very interesting feature of uh, RNA protein binding, and that it, indeed it's driven by electrostatic, because uh, uh, RNA is uh, negatively charged, and RNA binding proteins are typically for positive charge. Okay, so we thought, why don't we use something, uh, not just the distance, not just a blind choice like the distance, but we use something which is more informed about the process, still very gen general, but something more informed where we say, okay, we use as a collective variable an estimate of the electrostatic interaction between these two molecules. But I want to. I really want to show you this because I want to show you that you can do still and B even on, on very fancy variables. So how can you estimate the electrostatic interaction between two molecules? There are very rude models, uh, which uh, tells you which can be used. For example, one is to use like the bi huckel model. Uh, I say very rude also because we are not even using it in, in its best formulation where you take into account of different screening in different portions of, of the of the simulation box. We do it in the very uh, simple way, so we just compute electrostatic interaction as a sum of the screened electrostatic interaction where the screening is due to the 
counter ions, so the, to the ionic strength of the solution. And so we, we say, this is not our estimate of the free energy, right? This is just our driving uh, variable. We use it as a collective variable. It's a function of the position, so we can use it as a collective variable. And we add a bias, which is just uh, a function of this collective variable. Again, it's a moving restraint. And what we, we can do, we can start from NMR structure, so from the experimental structure, and pull out the ligand, or start from some random unbound structure and pull in the ligand. Put in, which means we, we force the interaction energy to decrease, and then we see where it goes. We don't enforce it to go to the right place. Sorry. Yes. The yes. is completely flexible. Uh, it's, uh, by, you mean by itself or in the simulation? In the simulation. No, we don't restrain anything. It's completely flexible. Yeah. It's not very flexible. I mean, RNA is much more flexible by itself, but we don't uh, enforce it. OK, so you can see that uh, in, in, in this case, the, the ligand is going to leave the molecules, whereas in the other case, it's going to, to bind, to, uh, to arrive bound to it. And OK, by chance, you see that here it's going to the right place. We, we will, I will tell you a bit more about where it goes in practice. Uh, OK, I'm, I'm going to just skip to the. Uh, I, I wanted just to, so my, my plan was just to give you the impression that you can do something also with more complex collective variables. So let me just uh, say that you can do combine forward pooling where you where you separate the two objects with the backward pooling where you where you uh, force them to uh, bound to bind, and you can use something which is a sort of generalization of Jasinski theorem for bidirectional poolings, which is some formulation uh, derived by Bean, Min, and Adib a couple of years ago, four years ago. And in this way, you can find the free energy profile in, in a manner which is more reliable because you combine over est uh, uh, excess estimate in one direction with excess estimate on the other direction. So you can bracket the correct solution. OK, I, I think it's not worthwhile to spend time in this. Maybe it's better to just answer the questions. I, I, I just tell you that we are able to, in this way, we, we are able to find many possible binding structures. And the ones where, for which we estimate more stability are those where the binding site is correct. So this is the NMR structure, and we found two typical structures which are, according to our prediction, they are uh, very stable. One is uh, very similar to the NMR structure, and the other, in the other you see that the peptide is oriented in the wrong way. So this means that we are able to predict the correct binding site. Uh, maybe we are not able to, correct, uh, to, to predict the correct binding pose because we have some doubt between these two ones. Or it could even be that uh, experimentally the, the, the two poses are uh, both present and are in competition in some way. And we are, we are trying to better understand this together with experimentalists that did the, the NMR. OK, so let me just go to the conclusion uh, of this part. So uh, the idea was to blindly predict the structure, even if we know it from uh, NMR, to test this methodology of uh, using uh, uh, um, interaction-free energy as a collective variable. And uh, OK, I didn't discuss this point, so we will not comment it. And uh, OK, I just say that this, I think, is a promising tool to study protein-RNA inter protein interaction, which is typically driven by electrostatics. OK, so now, very short perspective. I'm very happy that uh, now I've been able to collect some money to work on these things. And uh, uh, so my plan now is to work on uh, uh, improving models. I, I, I didn't show one of the negative results of the last project, and that's likely due to the force field. So something that one has to improve our force field and also algorithms for something. And, and then I'm working on, on uh, three big projects. One is. Uh, as I said already, interaction of RNA with eddy cases and other rival switches, and another is about coding on of bigger uh, non-coding RNA molecules. And so, of course, if you are interested in these things, I will open uh, tell me something, and I will open soon. Uh, I will be soon able to open new positions. Okay, I'm, I'm done. I just want to acknowledge my collaborators for this work, uh, Francesco Colitti for the first part. And for the second part, so Francesco Colitti is a postdoc in CISA now. And for the second part, a student in CISA, Dr. Rang, and uh, a collaborator, uh, Professor Paolo Cardoni from Germany. And finally, all of you for your attention.